Hi, everybody. Great to see you all today. Our declaration, The Fierce Remarkable book by Dan Yellen, contends with America's founding document, has its roots right here in Chicago. It's where Dan Yellen taught the Declaration of Independence to a night class of adult students. Together, they read deliberately and slowly. They read like authors dream their books will be read. They work their way through the document's 1,337 words. They read like poets, attentive to language, symbolism, and even punctuation. And they read like scientists, alert to new discoveries. And most fundamentally, they read with a passion to learn. Together, Danielle and her students came up with the fresh and original interpretations of this document that's been studied since the ink was dry. Danielle Allen describes those classes as the single most transformative experience of her career. She's written about justice and citizenship in both Athens and modern America, but our declaration is no history lesson or even a narrative examination of um, the origins of American democracy. Our de democracy illustrates how learning is a process. It's a process of inquiry. And Alan and her students came to a profound conclusion. Equality and freedom don't merely coexist. They're twin foundations of democracy, like food and water, or the moon and sun, they cannot exist without one another. It's impossible to stand alone, but it is equality that provides the strong base for freedom. It's the bedrock of democracy. That's the profound and original thesis for our, our democracy, and it's a perfect book for the Heartland Prize and a perfect book for the Chicago Humanities Festival and its wonderful citizens theme because only when there is equality can we truly be a nation of citizens. Looking back at our Heartland winners since the prize was established three decades ago, one can see that the fight for equality is explicit in the through line of these books. You could see it Taylor Branches at Canaan's Edge, Alex Kotlowitz on the other side of the river, Kevin Boyle's Arc of Justice, you can see this, this amazing fight for equality. Despite its name, the Heartland Prizes are not regional awards, they're not defined by a map, um, but they're what we believe to be the most admirable books from the metaphorical heart of the country. As our dear friend Stuart Dybeck describes it, it's the complex mix of passion and empathy we call the human heart. So we look for books with heart. Reading takes us together where we might be afraid to travel alone. Our declaration is a reminder that reading is an active act. In, in its structure and its tone, this book is a radical one because its style so mirrors its themes. Our declaration is a collaborative book with its author and readers in conversation. They're sort of, eager, sort of equals in this, this endeavor of shared inquiry. But before welcoming Danielle to the stage, I would just like to re note the first simple, elegant sentence of this year's Hartman winner. It reads, the Declaration of Independence matters because it helps us see we cannot have freedom without equality. And today's interlocutor will be my dear friend, Pulitzer Prize winning Tribune columnist, Mary Schmeek. And I welcome Mary and Danielle to the stage and I'll present Danielle with her prize. Liz, that's astonishing, truly, and such generous words, thank you. Appreciate it. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Hi, everybody. 
First, I want to thank Danielle for making me do something I am embarrassed to say I've never done. I had never read the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> or if I did, I did not remember reading it. How many of you have read it? Okay. Yay, An erudite crowd. <laughs> Um, before we start talking, I asked Danielle if she would do something for us, which is to lead us through, collectively, the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. So Mary has proposed a call and response. Okay, so get ready. <laughs> Dig in. So the idea is I'll give you a phrase and then you'll repeat it back to me and we'll make our way through the long first sentence, first paragraph of the declaration. You ready? Yes. All right, okay. When in the course of human events, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people, it becomes necessary for one people, Dissolve the band, the political bands which have connected them to another. To dissolve the political bands which have connected them to another. And to assume among the powers of the earth. And to assume among the powers of the earth. The separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. The separate and equal station. Equal station to which the laws of nature <laughs> and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind, requires that they should declare the causes, requires that they should declare the causes, which impel them to that separation. Which impel them to that separation. Well done. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> There is something thrilling about that language, isn't there? It is extraordinary. I mean, they knew how to write, and they were rhetoricians who wrote to be heard. They didn't write to be read, and that is one of the important things about the document. I think in order to understand its full force, it does make a difference to read it out loud, which is exactly how we always started in my classes. Oh, cool. One sentence per student around the room until you'd read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. so. so before we get to more about the words. I know you say that understanding the history of the time is not required to understand this document, but just give us some historical setting. What, what did this land look like at the time that this document emerged? So it was not a densely populated place such as we know now. So three million people, roughly speaking, um, throughout the colonies. It was puny in that regard compared to Great Britain or France or Spain. And similarly, there were militia, but they were ragtag. There was no great military force. There was certainly a growing economy. There was a sense of increasing prosperity, but nothing that could compare to the sort of wealth that Britain had. The place was also more diverse than we usually think of it as being. So we tend to think of the colonists as having been largely English, but in fact there were lots of Germans and Scandinavians and people from other parts of Europe as well. And of course there were all the Africans who were there mostly in slavery, but with free blacks actually throughout the colonies, and Native Americans, some of whom were engaged in unrelenting hostility with the colonists, others of whom were engaged in more collaborative uh, interactions with the colonists at that time. So that's the land. That's the land. And at some point, the colonists have had enough. And in your language, they decide that they want to divorce King George. Yeah, exactly, yes. They've had enough, they're ready for a declaration of divorce and a declaration of remarriage. Um, and in fact, declarations of marriage were, I mean, that's the legal form that they used for marriage at the time, and this document really does draw from that legal tradition of divorce and marriage. It uses the same vocabulary, which is important because it underscores how legalistic they were. They were lawyers. They were really well-educated lawyers, um, which is important to understanding um, the text and the moments of the revolution. 
So one of the things that I hadn't fully realized, I think most of us learned in grade school that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration <laughs> of Independence, and it turns out that this is an example of what you call democratic writing or group writing or what might now be called crowdsourcing. Right. Um, it's, you know, a reporter's nightmare. All of these people have their hands on your copy. That's right. But just tell us about the process and the, the committee that, that shaped these words. Sure. So if one of the things that's come out of writing this book for me is I have a few, you know, pet peeves slash crazy projects, unicorn type projects. Uh, one of my unicorn type projects is wanting to get the State Department to change the question on the citizenship exam. That exam often has on it the question, who wrote the Declaration of Independence? And the ostensible correct answer is Thomas Jefferson. Uh, that's what you're supposed to say if you want to be a citizen. But the correct answer is that Continental Congress wrote the declaration based on a committee draft where Jefferson chaired the committee, but where important contributions were also made by John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Robert Livingston. So what actually happened, um, John Adams, Massachusetts, never owned slaves, thought slavery was a bad thing, teamed up in the fall of 1775 with Richard Henry Lee from Virginia. They were both radicals in Continental Congress, committed to independence, and they wanted to try to get the rest of their colleagues there. And they developed a quite powerful strategy, which we could go into in more detail if it's of interest. But at any rate, that strategy led them to be pushing all the colonies to write constitutions. And people often miss this fact, that before they all committed themselves to revolution, they first committed themselves to constitutions. So by July 4th, Virginia, Georgia, South Carolina, New Jersey, and New Hampshire had all already written constitutions for themselves. And the, all the colonies were committed to that process. Pennsylvania finished in July of 1776. And it was that commitment that permitted them to go forward with revolution. And it was really Adams and Lee who were this team. On May 15th, 1776, Adams got a resolution passed in Philadelphia in Congress to the effect that every colony should take up new government. And in Virginia, on the same day, thanks to Lee's hard work, the Virginians voted to write their constitution. And that was really the first step towards the complete break with Britain. And then June 7th in Congress, Richard Henry Lee stood up and proposed independence. Okay? Now, Congress knew if it was going to do anything as radical as that, it wanted unanimity. And they knew they weren't going to have unanimity then in early June. So they postponed the vote on that resolution until July 2nd. But in the meanwhile, they did what they always did when they had a resolution on the table. They set up a committee to write a preamble for the resolution. They used committees for everything that they did. And Adams, who was driving this whole process at this point, had come to admire Jefferson. He thought he was a fantastic writer, and he wanted Jefferson as the chair of this committee. And so he worked the hustings, and he got Jefferson elected by one vote. You know, whoever got the most votes was chair of the committee. That's how it worked. So that's, and Jefferson, truth be told, wasn't very busy, okay? <laughs> he was one of the youngest members of Congress, 33. He wasn't on lots of committees, okay? When Congress decided to move forward with the Declaration, they also set up a committee for, to write the Articles of Confederation and a committee to write treaties with France and Spain. And the other men who got elected to the Declaration Committee were also on those other committees. Jefferson was the only one with nothing else to do. So this was why he was the chair. Um, and they, the group talked about what they wanted in the Declaration. He did a draft, gave it to Franklin and Adams. They made important changes. So creator comes from those conversations with Adams and Franklin. Self-evidence comes from those conversations. Other changes as well. And then they gave it to the whole committee. The whole committee signed off. The committee gave it to Congress. Congress then cut 25% of the draft. They including added... Including the passage about slavery. Including the passage about slavery. Yes, we should come back to that. Yeah. They added the language about supreme judge of the world and divine providence at the end, and they added the language from Richard Henry Lee's resolution, and then they voted on it. So there are a lot of voices in the Declaration of Independence, and, and Jefferson's those... eloquence matters, but it's not the whole story. And then there were further changes made when it got to the people who typeset it or wrote it out, and some significant insertions there, right? Absolutely, yeah. This is one of the crazy things about the Declaration is we think that there's one text, uh, one hallowed text, but actually there are multiple versions of it. And even in the summer of 1776, people were reading different versions of it. 
uh, with the most significant difference being one that to tell you, you have to tell you the whole second sentence. Do you mind? Go ahead. All right, okay. So you know the famous second sentence, but just listen to it for a second. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principle and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Did you know it was that long? I thought I was going to stop after pursuit of happiness. One sentence, huh? right? Exactly. It's one sentence. All of Jefferson's draft, it's one sentence. In Adam's handwritten draft, it's one sentence. In the first printing that Congress commissioned by John, John Dunlap, it's one sentence. In the minute book, the official minute book written out by Congress, by their secretary, Charles Thompson, it's one sentence. And then there was this guy named Benjamin Town, who was a printer who'd shown up in Philadelphia relatively recently and who had decided to make his mark by scooping everybody. So he was the only person who printed his newspaper several days a week, and his goal was always to get stuff in faster than anybody else, and he didn't care how accurate it was. <laughs> he got his hands on a copy of the Declaration, we know not how. He got his hands on a copy before the general public outside of Congress should have gotten it, and he published it in his newspaper on July 6th, breaking that long sentence into two with a period after pursuit of happiness. John Dunlap, the official printer, didn't publish it in his newspaper until July 8th. Those two days made a huge difference, so Towns' paper started circulating. So Towns and Dunlap's texts were two competing versions right from the very beginning. And if you think about it, it matters, right? Because that whole sentence starts, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Where does the list of truths end? Does it end after the mere invocation of individual rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? Or does it, as it in fact does do, proceed all the way to that end of the long sentence, the end of a long argument, which is an argument, it's a theory of revolution. The conclusion is that our individual rights lead us to want to build governments to protect them, and therefore if governments aren't doing their job, we change them, we alter them, or abolish them in the case of the revolution. All right, so from the get-go, there are these two different ways of thinking about what those self-evident truths are really about. So, you know, as you can tell from listening to Danielle, she is a very meticulous reader. And you talk about slow reading. Yeah. Slow reading being the way you taught your students to read this. Slow reading the way I very intentionally read your book, which made it more meaningful, because it's very, you know, logical. This sentence goes to that sentence. And right. you talk about, I just want to digress from the text for a moment. Sure. And you talk about learning slow reading as a child when your family read the Bible, mm -hmm. the entire Bible, twice. twice. Yeah. <laughs> After dinner, yeah, uh, you know, chapter a night basically it takes a few years when you do it that way. So that's slow reading for you. So, um, and yes, I mean, it also to read at the pace that you hear, that you listen, right, is slower than how as adults we all generally read. And it does require you to pay more attention to how sentences are put together and how ideas relate to each other. Or how images travel through a text and through metaphor carry meanings with them, sort of quietly, a little bit below the surface in a text. I want to get back to the text, but just tell us a little bit more about the family that you grew up in and how it cultivated your, not only your, the way you read, um, but your fascination with politics. Sure. So um, I'm a faculty brat. So I'm one of these kids who grew up in an academic town in Southern California. And my dad was a professor of political science and my mom a librarian. Um, so that way we were a very book-oriented family. Um, but both of my parents also came from political traditions in various ways. My dad, who's African-American, was from North Florida. And his dad had been uh, one of the people who helped found the first NAACP chapter in North Florida, which I don't know how well you know North Florida, but that was a pretty dangerous thing to do. <laughs> Just put it that way. 
And my mom grew up in Michigan where her family had been involved in progressive politics um, for a long time. So my favorite story growing up was always about how when my great-grandmother, um, who was a suffragette, had, as it happened, ended up going to the hospital um, to give birth um, right when the major suffragette march was scheduled for, my great-grandfather had, at an appropriate point in that process, gone and taken her place in the march so that she could feel that she was represented um, in the march. Um, so there were both of those traditions um, in the family. That, so from the get-go, from an early age, the dinner table was a place where we talked about politics as well as reading the Bible after dinner <laughs> as it happens. So. And then you went on to study classics, to be a classicist. How has studying classics affected the way you read the Declaration of Independence? <clears throat> so that is, I mean, one of the funny things about the book is it really is, uh, you know, a book about American history and American texts written by somebody who was trained as a stu student of ancient history. And what that means is, when you're learning Greek or Latin, the only way you can read Greek is incredibly slowly, <laughs> just because it's really hard. And so it was that practice of, in, you know, what you do in a Greek class, if you're trying to read Socrates, Plato's Apologies, or read Socrates' words in Plato's Apology, is you go around a table and you just go line by line, sort of working out the syntax as you go. And so there's a funny way in which I think that really prepared me to be a teacher of a text that is for us now ancient, right? I mean, the language of the Declaration is not the language any of us any longer uses. The sentences are much longer, the syntax is much more complex than what we're used to. Um, and so it's worth it to take the time and go ahead and do it in that slow way. And it's short, you know, it's, yeah. It's a lot shorter than Plato's Apology, so it doesn't take as long to do it. So let's go back to the text. The part of the Declaration of Independence that most people have not read, even if they think they know the Declaration, is the latter part of it, mm. the grievances, mm -hmm. the things that the colonists were angry about, the irreconcilable differences. Yes. Before we get to the first part of it again, <laughs> just tell us, what, what were they so upset about? What could they not stand anymore? So one of the things I love about the Declaration, and that was news to me as I started to dig into it, is that it wasn't just that the men in Congress sort of came up with a list of complaints. I mean, they actually put ads in all the papers in the colonies and asked people to write in with their view about what Britain was doing. So they went through this quite elaborate information gathering process to figure out what everybody else thought the problem with Britain was. Um, and when you, it's, if you look at the list of grievances, as they kind of compressed everything and boiled it down, it actually splits into two things, really. Um, and this is sort of, isn't in my book, so this is something I've gotten clearer about later. Half of the grievances are basically complaints that the king has violated what we would now call constitutional requirements. So it sort of details, here are the violations with regard to the legislative function, here are the violations with regard to the executive function, here are the violations with regard to the judicial function. So the point is just that they had developed a very clear sense of the kind of legal and political framework that was necessary for a group of people to achieve prosperity and freedom for themselves, and sort of chance to govern their own lives. So you know, they were complaining about the fact that in Massachusetts, the king had forced the assembly to move farther away from the seat of government, which just made it harder for people to attend. It made it harder for them to have the records they needed to do their work. It just generally weakened the legislative capacity and meant that the king could kind of ride roughshod over whatever their own policy choices were. Right, so that was the kind of thing they were complaining about. Or in this kind of hyperbolic um, complaint, they considered that the king was sending way too many tax officers to the shores of the colonies. And, uh, were frustrated with what he was doing with import tax requirements and things like that. Um, but, but what it really boiled down to is sort of this view about constitutions. Um, and that was really John Adams' approach. He was the person who was using this constitutional framework to analyze the problems. And in the middle of the grievances, you have this huge chunk of stuff, which sounds like it's repeating the rest of it, which turns out to be just a complaint about the Quebec Act which was an act that Parliament had passed restoring various powers in the Quebec province to the locals there, letting Catholicism have a place again and so forth. They were very anti-Catholic, which is an important thing to remember about the Declaration, and it's a complaint there. And that's Jefferson's pet peeve. <laughs> so Jefferson's pet peeve is sort of stuck into the middle of the list of grievances, um, but the bigger framework that everybody else was using 
um, was the sort of constitutional framework violations of constitutional principles. So they've decided they cannot reconcile these differences. Yes. And the only thing to do is to, in your term, get divorced. Right, exactly. So then they, then they set up the grievances. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about some specific words. Sure. Because part of what you do here is to zero in on words. So some of the language that we know is all men are created equal. Yeah. Men. Good. Talk to us about men. Absolutely. So this is obviously an important question. What does all men are created equal mean? Did it mean everybody or did it just mean white male property holders? And there are a couple of really important pieces of evidence that help us answer that question. Most importantly, the passage that Congress cut out that when I was, we were just talking about it. In the draft that the committee submitted to Congress, there was a long paragraph condemning King George for the slave trade. And the language of the condemnation is that the king has violated the sacred rights and, of life and liberty of a distant people in Africa who never did him any wrong. And among the king's violations are that he's kept open slave markets where men, all caps, are bought and sold. Now, clearly, in that instance, on the auction block, it's not just males that are being bought and sold. It's women and children as well, all age groups. So we know that they were using men in a universal sense there. And that all caps, the all caps is in Jefferson's handwriting, is also super important because Jefferson, strange guy as he was, and innovator in so many ways, was also, of all things, an innovator in capitalization, all right? So the reason that we don't capitalize every noun in our sentences is partly to do with Jefferson, okay? Because he stopped capitalizing anything. He didn't capitalize even at the starts of sentences, although the norm at the time was you capitalize even the nouns all the way through a sentence. So the fact that he wrote men in all caps in that sentence was a real emphatic insistence on the humanity and equal status as rights-bearing creatures of Africans um, to the colonists. So that word there in that passage both lets us know that men did mean universally males and females and that it actually meant people of all races, astonishingly. So let's talk about God. Now, I can't remember if the word God is in there, but creator is in there, supreme nature's judge is God. in yeah, there. Nature's God, yeah, laws of nature and nature's God. So tell us how God figures into this. So there are two important compromises in the Declaration, and I think it's really important to underscore that because we typically understand the Constitution as having been a compromise document, right? Sort of major compromises. But the Declaration was a compromise document too. And the two compromises were one around slavery and two around religion. Okay, we can talk about the slavery one in a minute if it's of interest. Um, but so the compromise around religion is simply that you had, even just take the drafting committee for example, Benjamin Franklin, an avowed deist, which is to say he did believe in some sort of principle of divinity, nature somehow being equivalent to divinity, but not specifically in Christian theology. Same with Jefferson, ultimately deist, again, believes in sort of the idea of nature as a god, hence the phrase nature's god, but not necessarily Christian theology. John Adams, pious, conventional Christian. Roger Sherman, very rigorous Puritan. <laughs> okay, sort of trying to think of what you learned about the pilgrims originally. And then Robert Livingston, again, from New York, relatively conventional, presuming, presumably uh, Christian. So the point is, they actually had quite serious theological differences amongst themselves. And so they found language that permitted people who disagreed about religion um, to endorse the document. So the document is not Christian by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it is language that Christians can use and that fit their theological framework, but it's language that people who aren't Christians also can um, adopt and feel comfortable with. So it was an incredibly important compromise that they did not, in the end, uh, try to push the notion of making the document sectarian in any kind of way. So two other words I want to talk about. Freedom and equality. Mm. So your basic premise here is that there is no freedom without equality. That's right. But yeah. the way that we've talked about this document, freedom is more significant. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. first of all, define freedom, mm -hmm. define equality, and then tell us about the, the relationship that you've redrawn between them. Sure. So this is an interesting thing about um, 
democracies and their ideals, right? So you can't have a democracy without having ideals. It's very different from a monarchy where if you want to sort of say, well, what's a monarchy about? You have to just like point to a picture of the king. It's like that's what a monarchy is about, right? But how do you explain what a democracy is? There's nothing to point to, okay? <laughs> There's only an abstraction of the people. And how on earth do you make this thing called the people? Um, the only way you can make it is if there is an egalitarian bond, because otherwise the people splits into the people who are in charge and the people who aren't in charge, and then it's not the people anymore. All right? So that's one of the funny things. You actually need the ideals of equality and freedom just to make sense of the idea of the people in the first place. But there's more that can be said about that, if you don't mind my going on for a little Please. second on this point. So there, you know, ancient Athens had a democracy, ancient Rome had a republic, there were democracies and republics in early modern Europe, Venice, Florence, places like that. And they too wrestled with how do you define freedom, how do you define equality, how do you put these concepts in relationship to each other. And at the early, in the early 19th century, there's a French philosopher named Benjamin Constant who does a really interesting thing with these concepts. He writes a little piece called uh, ancient, Liberty Ancient and Modern, basically. And he makes the argument that what the ancients cared about, sort of Athens, Rome, and so forth, was the right to participate in politics, popular sovereignty, and in effect, freedom from domination. The idea being that if you're actually participating in government, and participating in making laws, then there's no way you can be dominated because you're in control of the laws that are being made that organize your life. Okay? And that was the liberty of the ancients. And they said, but now there's this new kind of liberty that's come along, this liberty of the moderns. And what the moderns want is they just want freedom from interference. They want to be left alone to make contracts and do commercial things and enjoy their material pleasures in their own world. And so then we got this split in the early 19th century, so after the Declaration was written, between freedom from domination and freedom from interference. And it's that latter concept, freedom from interference, that has come to populate our discourse today. It's the main way people think about freedom now. Whereas when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, they were still using the freedom from domination idea. And so that's why freedom and equality come together, because in order not to be dominated by external enemies and not to be dominated by people inside your own society, you have to establish egalitarian bonds. You have to establish egalitarian bonds to make the people, which can then defend you from external domination, but similarly you need equality to make sure that nobody internally to the people is dominating anybody else. So when you define freedom as freedom from domination, it goes hand in glove with equality. A tough one, I know. It's very abstract, um, and it's hard to dig into these concepts in this sort of abstract and way. And equality of what? It's a beautiful question. So, okay. Anytime anybody invokes the concept of equality, the first thing you should say is ask exactly that question. Which kind of equality? What does that mean? So does it mean moral equality? Which is to say recognition that human beings everywhere have the same fundamental moral worth. Okay, regardless of abilities, capacities, where they end up in life, they've got some basic human dignity. And the UN Human Rights Declaration sort of grounded on that idea of the moral worth of human beings. Or, if not moral equality, do you mean social equality? Do you mean the question of the relations we have among, with one another in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools? When people go to apply for a job, do they all have equal chances? Um, do you mean social equality, one could say? Or do you mean political equality? Now, political equality consists of equal access to the tools of government. We usually think of that as voting rights, the right to serve on juries, uh, the right to run for public office. Um, I would argue for a richer notion of egalitarian empowerment, which means also that you need education, that puts you, it prepares you to be competitive in the political system and so forth. But so then there's political equality is another category of equality. And then there's economic questions. And do you want to say economic equality or justice or fairness or opportunity? And the question of how things in the economic domain relate to moral equality, social equality, or political equality. The Declaration of Independence is fundamentally about political equality. The empowerment of citizens as part of the people to be sovereign, to be responsible for their government. Its arguments about political equality depend on, they're built on a foundation of moral equality, a recognition of human moral equality, 
and they invoke a need for social equality to support that political equality. The Declaration doesn't have much to say about economic questions. That doesn't mean that those should be off the table, but there does, it's an interesting question to ask, what is it that one wants to say about economic matters if one starts, first of all, from the question of how to achieve political equality within a democratic citizenry? Which brings us back to the passage about slavery, the excised passage about slavery. Yes, yeah. What did it say and why was it excised? So I said there were two compromises in the Declaration, one around religion and the other around slavery. Uh, the passage condemning King George was excised as that's the pro-slavery moment of compromise, right? So this is you know, a complaint that the sacred rights of life and liberty of Africans are being violated and that gets cut out. Um, the anti-slavery compromise comes in that all-important second sentence. Again, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? That all men are created equal, endowed with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That list, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, was the list that came out of the anti-slavery position. The alternative was the property concept instead of the happiness concept, okay? It should be a question for everybody. Why is happiness there in that list? It was very weird within the history of ideas. John Locke had talked about life, liberty, and property. So the fact that we suddenly get this move to happiness is notable. And it's, it's Adams as it happens. I mean, he's, he's been using the happiness concept for a year. He publishes a pamphlet in April of 1776, arguing that the purpose of government as for the purpose of individual human beings is happiness. Um, and when he does that, what he's doing is arguing against, in particular, the Virginians who have started in using the property concept to defend slavery. Um, what happened was that in the fall of 1775, the royal governor in Virginia, Lord Dunmore, proclaimed that any slave who escaped from a plantation and fought for the British would be free. And this radicalized the Virginians instantly. It had been a bit slow, actually, to move towards revolution. But the language of their complaint then was that the king was violating their property rights. And by the time we get to May, June, July of 1776, the property term has become completely contested in the argument over slavery. And you can see that in the minutes of Continental Congress when the same thing, when they come to the Articles of Confederation, there's an explicit argument about whether they can use the word property or not because there, you know, can slaves be called property or not and so forth with the different sides lining up around that. So, Happiness was a compromised term, but it was a term that was produced by the anti-slavery participants in the Continental Congress. Hmm. And happiness, I think, is a word that we don't really comprehend in the same way that they intended it, right? Well, you know, you see all these billboards that say, like, you buy this underwear and, you know, <laughs> the pursuit of happiness. And, yeah, it does make you think that the concept is not really quite what it used to be. <laughs> so it's true. I mean, uh, it's... They um, meant by it really an idea of human flourishing, individually and collectively. So for them really the question was, you, you wanted to test whether you were happy by imagining, asking yourself at the end of your life, have I lived a life worth living? That was the test of whether you'd achieved happiness. And so that meant you know, good decision making and building good character and strong relationships with the people around you. It wasn't a hedonistic concept at all. And then similarly, they, uh, Adams always used the language of the safety and happiness of the people, connecting it to that individual happiness idea. And he was drawing there, again, on that ancient traditional political thought, the sort of very famous line from Cicero that got repeated over and over again, which went, salus populi suprema lex est, which means, the greatest law of all, the law from which all other political choices depend on or come, flow from, is, that, is the health and well-being of the people. Everything follows, f flows from trying to secure the salus populi, the health and well-being of the people. And that notion of flourishing of a collective uh, is what really lies behind the idea of safety and happiness of the people. Um, a slightly more personal question. You note in the book that you are mixed race. Mm. That's the term you use. And then you have in parentheses, isn't everyone. <laughs> do you th how do you feel that being mixed race has affected your interest, your perspective on this document, these issues? Well, it's funny. You know, I'm, um, 
I am more than happy to try to answer that question, although as it, I've been asked that question at various points in time, I realize I don't really have a comparison, if you see what I mean. Sure. <laughs> that is, I, I don't know what it's like to like, not be mixed. I can't say you know, what's different, but I can say that um, you know, it's certainly the case that coming to understand America's racial formation has been an important part of my own self-understanding, right? Sort of why is it that we have the categories that we do, white, black, and so forth? Why is it that at the end of the day, um, you know, you can see lots of ways in which people with African-American backgrounds, um, you know, what's the right, you know, the whole tradition of passing. So, you know, just lots and lots of African-American descendants are at this point completely merged into the white population because benefits of being white are so serious and profound that it's obviously the thing that people are going to do to protect themselves and their family. And so, you know, how do you get, why do you get that kind of dynamic and sort of what does it mean for a people? Um, so, I mean, I, I suppose in a way it just, um, I mean, and then maybe another piece of it is just, you know, I've got parents from both racial groups and so it means you don't want to take sides in a certain sort of way on some issues, um, but neither do you want to obscure the depth of the problem, the depth of the difficulty around race that characterizes this country. Looking at the ideals in this document, where is this country failing to live up to these ideals? So, this is another one of the, you know, the things I told you about my different, um, you know, unicorn projects or sort of pet peeves that have developed as a course of doing this. So one is, you know, I wanted to get the State Department to change the citizen test. Another one is I'm trying to get the National Archives to change its online transcription of the Declaration of Independence because they use, as the basis for their transcription, an 1823 engraving which uses the Benjamin Town period in that second sentence. As that just seems to me wrong. And then my third thing that's come out of working on this project goes in a completely different direction, <laughs> which is to say I started using the Declaration for my own device for trying to think through contemporary American politics. So I asked myself the question, what is the course of events? You know, what are the patterns that I think we need to name and consider meaningful? And I asked myself the question, you know, if we look at our principles and how we've organized the powers of government, are they succeeding or failing at achieving and securing the safety and happiness of the whole people? And the result of asking myself those questions about the course of human events, and the question of whether or not we've organized the powers of government in such a way as to secure the safety and happiness of the people is that I have become an ardent supporter of the need to end the war on drugs. Okay, now that's funny, isn't it? A long way from the Declaration of Independence. But why is that exactly? It's because if I look around our world and consider the course of events and where we think our problems are, right? We think we've got problems around poverty, around urban education, around now more presently around police violence, around violence generally in urban contexts. These are not problems that emerge out of nowhere or descend somehow from heaven or come from outside our borders. We have actually made them with how we have organized our world. And how have we done that exactly? So you all know about the drug laws and the criminalization of drugs starting in 1971 with Nixon and then the Rockefeller drug laws. But I wonder if you know these other things, like how much Americans spend every year on drugs? Anybody? I'm just curious, put your, your hand up if you think you know how much that number is. $100 billion every year. That's how broad the social acceptance of drug use is. $100 billion. Our defense budget, $600 billion. Consider that comparison, right? And we also know that despite that widespread social acceptance and drug use is completely equal opportunity across ethnic and racial groups, that sentencing is massively disproportionate across racial groups, right? And then we also know, so once you have this kind of, we have 30, in 2013, 32% of new cases filed in state courts were for nonviolent drug offenses. 32%, think about what that does to your judicial system if you overload it in that way. Okay, so what's the consequence of that? Prosecutors, this is anecdotal from police, but prosecutors, according to some police, only want open and shut cases 
to prosecute, which makes it much harder, harder to prosecute things like homicide, which is one of the reasons that homicide clearance rates have fallen in all of our cities. In the 50s, homicide clearance rates across the country were at 90%. They're down to 50%. When you don't clear homicides, you increase the level of violence in the community. Okay? So an overloaded judicial system cannot clear homicides. And if you can't clear homicides, you increase violence. Okay? Now, my last little detail on this one, this is like my reading of the course of human events. Compare the situation to tobacco. We've brought smoking down 50% since 1964, and even more dramatically among young people. The level of drug use now is exactly the same as it was in the early 1970s. We have not moved it at all. At this cost? Really? <laughs> so that's where I've gotten from the declaration. <laughs> so. so we have a few questions from the audience here. I'm going to read them if I can read your handwriting. How did you find the time to write so many books with teaching, <laughs> raising children? Oh, gosh. Well, Advice to other young <laughs> aspiring PhDs. <laughs> um, gosh, that's not an easy question to answer, in fact. I mean, I think um, the short answer is just that if you have something you care about, you just kind of keep doing it uh, one step after another, and eventually you get to the end. You asked me when we were chatting in the beforehand uh, when I had started writing this book, and the answer is 2007 didn't come out until 2014. So just to give whoever asked the question a sense of, you know, you stay at it, stay at it. You know, it right, might you not happen immediately. You had a couple detours there. One detour was the book that you wrote that you, the book you wrote on the Declaration of Independence that you jettisoned. It's true, yeah. Um, and then you went to work for Barack Obama for a while. Right? As a, yeah, for a couple of months in uh, December 2007 through about February of 2008 in the primaries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Before I get to this, can I ask a quick question? How do you evaluate his presidency? Uh, <laughs> um, so I continue to be a great admirer of Barack Obama. And I, you know, there are strengths and weaknesses in the presidency without any question. I think that there are some tremendous achievements for which history will recognize him, though you know, not as of yet. So for example, I do think that the steering of the country through the financial crisis of 2008 was remarkable and deserves far more credit than he conventionally gets for it. And I don't know exactly what the future of the health care law is, um, but I think to have established the principle that this country really should make it possible for all, everybody who's here to have health care is also a monumental achievement. I would criticize him in the foreign policy realm, in all honesty. Um, but I would perhaps put that in somewhat different terms than other people. Uh, I think I w would say that I have perceived from this administration an effective abandonment of Europe. And I think that's been a tremendous mistake. Question from the audience. Why the change from Locke's life, liberty, and property to the pursuit of happiness? You pretty yeah. much answered that, yeah? I did a little bit. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's worth saying anything more about the pursuit of happiness concept. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, maybe the one other thing to add about that. Um, so I, I explained how pursuit of happiness is the anti-slavery moment in the Declaration. And it's important to notice that because, again, it's something about how we've gotten to the habit of teaching the history of this country. We've lost sight of the fact that right from the founding, an abolition movement moved forward. So in January of 1777, an African-American in Boston named Prince Hall cited the second sentence of the Declaration to put a proposition to the Massachusetts Assembly to end slavery there. Vermont, which wasn't a state at the time, it was its own country, which I love the idea of Vermont being its own country. <laughs> but in 1777, abolished slavery, and Pennsylvania and Massachusetts followed in 1780. In all those cases, they use the Declaration and precisely that anti-slavery moment in the Declaration to do that work. 
And so because we've gotten to so powerfully associate the Declaration with Jefferson, we've really lost sight of the fact that it was a genuinely anti-slavery document used as such immediately in really important ways. So there was more than one political tradition that flew, flowed out of the founding. And so for me, the, the pursuit of happiness language, it's really important to, to see it as the start of the abolitionist movement and the abolition-oriented political tradition in this country. Um, question, what prompted you to put together a forum to help decipher what the Constitution means? I think he means the Declaration. Unless you have a... A forum? Uh, are you uh, teaching the Constitution too? Right. Um, so, no, I mean, I, I, as you might imagine, I've now begun to think a lot more about the Constitution as well. It's pretty hard to sort of spend a lot of time working on the Declaration and not move on to the Constitution. Although I'm kind of trying to take a little sort of byway through the Articles of Confederation, because nobody ever pays attention to the Articles of Confederation, and I feel a little sorry for them. Um, but, so, I mean, let me, so why did I start teaching the Declaration? Because that's really where this all started. And it was this incredible experience, thanks to the Illinois Humanities Council, an organization I celebrate and hope that you all affirm, uh, which sponsors a program called the Odyssey Project, which is a night course for low-income adults. And the goal of the project was to give adults who had perhaps fallen out of the educational system access to the same quality of educational opportunities as you can get at, say, the University of Chicago. And so it was a one-year course in the humanities, and you know, students did history, U.S. history, philosophy, literature, art history, critical thinking, and writing. And I kind of was a pinch hitter. I taught in a number of different units here. But there's a sort of challenge if what you're doing is trying to give the same quality of education to your night students as you give to your day students at the university, and maybe your night students haven't even finished high school, right? whereas your day students have gone to some of the best high schools in the country. You know, how do you give them the same quality of education? And suddenly I realized that you don't have to compromise at all on the quality of what you're doing, but you can compromise on the quantity, that is to say the length of texts that you're giving students. And so for the most uh, you know, just pragmatic, instrumentalist reasons, I started teaching the Declaration of Independence because it was short. Like, that's it. That was my basic reason. And then I discovered that my students had never read the Declaration and thought of it as something quite apart from them. I mean, mostly African-American students, some Latina students, some white students, and again, all roughly at the poverty line. And then this incredible thing happened, which is that they got the text so much faster than my other students. Why do you think that is? Because they had, they had made a decision to change the course of their lives. That's why they were in the class. And that's what the people who wrote the Declaration had decided to do. <laughs> and so it spoke to them immediately, and they understood its core story about human agency um, in a way that my day students, who bless their hearts and have great affection for them and wonderful as they are, I mean, they were in college because you go to college when you come from one of the best high schools in the country and so forth. They hadn't had to claim the course of their own lives. But my adult students were doing exactly that. And so that, they really, that they took me to the heart of the Declaration of Independence. What is the core message that you want people to get from the Declaration of Independence? So, okay, I hate to do this to you, but I'm gonna have to do it again. It's the second sentence. I'm just gonna repeat it again because the core message is really right there. So, apologies. Well, you know what, before you do that, let me see how right. much time we have because <laughs> I want them to recite it uh, too. Okay. So, Should we just okay. go for it? I'm yeah, let's go. Where we are. Okay. okay. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. To be self-evident. To be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator. That they are endowed by their creator. With certain unalienable rights. With certain unalienable rights. That among these. That among these. Are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights. That to secure these rights. Governments are instituted among men. Governments are instituted among men. Deriving their just powers. Deriving their just powers. From the consent of the governed. From the consent of the governed. That whenever any government becomes destructive of these ends. That whenever any government becomes destructive of these ends. 
It is the right of the people. It is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. To alter or to abolish it. And to institute new government. And to institute new government. Laying its foundation on such principle. Laying its foundation on such principle. And organizing its power in such form. And organizing its power in such form. As to them, as to them, shall seem most likely, shall seem most likely, to affect their safety and happiness. To affect their safety and happiness. That's my takeaway message. <laughs> the people, as to us, shall seem most likely to affect our safety and happiness. We have a responsibility to make those probabilistic judgments about how to secure our collective well-being, the well-being for our society, so that we can all then also flourish within the context of that shared flourishing. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle, I think maybe we have one question here. I'm 58 years old um, and I've become increasingly pessimistic that we can figure out a way forward for the society despite the sort of idealism of the so-called founding fathers. So kind of a couple questions. One, can it still work what they created that was so long ago with just 13 colonies and 3 million people and now with just so seemingly so such an enormous bureaucracy that we have that, you know, but I guess what I'd like some thoughts on your part as to uh, practical ways sort of for the, for the people to go forward or is it sure. going to be pessimistic for a long time to come? So one answer and then one brief suggestion and I'll try to be brief about both. So the people, the men of 1776 and then 1789 did something remarkable they looked at history, they saw that democracies, republics had never existed at a larger scale than the city-state. They aspired to something bigger, they invented our federal system. And they were right, it was possible to scale democracy if you used this building block approach of federalism. But because they started with such a small population, they never had to consider the question of what you would do if they were really right. And the place really thrived until it ended up with 300 million, 350 million people and so on. And so we do actually have a theoretical question in front of us of whether or not at a certain point size starts to make a change in quality too. Can you actually still run this thing at this scale? And if so, how? With what structure? The world has never actually asked this theoretical question and we have to do that, right? That's large scale. Very small scale, 60% of Americans who are eligible to vote are registered. Go find somebody you know who's not registered, get them registered, get them voting. That's the most important thing. So thank you, Mary. This is a lot thank of fun. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> and thank you for inspiring us to think about this. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.